And our next speaker is Dr. Omar Anjum. Uh, he'll be speaking about truth and life, thoughts on a chronic balance. Dr. Anjum is the chair of Islamic studies at the University of Toledo. He obtained his PhD at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. While trained as a historian, his work is interdisciplinary, drawing on classic Islamic studies, political philosophy, and cultural anthropology. He is the author of Politics, Law, and Community in Islamic Thought, The Taimiyan Moment. He has a forthcoming edited volume on Islam after the 2011 Arab uprising and a monograph on the foundations of modern Islamic political thought. And please help me welcome Dr. Thank you very much. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. In the name of God, most merciful, always merciful. Peace be with you all. Uh, I have to disagree with Sister uh, Parmul for, uh, on, on one thing, uh, on, on her incredible humility. Uh, I think it is her act that is hard to follow because I think there is nothing uh, that is more telling about the Prophet and what Islam is to common Muslims, um, in fact, to all Muslims, than the prophetic love for the poor and the wretched. Uh, it does not make sense except through the words of a prophet. It has no sociopolitical sense other than it is prophets who love the poor and the wretched. And I think that is human dignity in Islam in a nutshell. Uh, let me begin by noting that I make, uh, I'll make certain philosophical and, and uh, theological reflections on Islamic tradition and its founding document, uh, Islam's holy scripture, the Quran. As an intellectual historian, I'm not suggesting whether the modern notion of freedom or individual rights did or did not exist prior to modernity. I know these concepts have a history and assumptions that have their roots in particular modern developments. I'm also unsure whether the contemporary formulations are the only and most desirable concepts to aid protections of life, coexistence, and peace. Clearly, they haven't served us extremely well. But I'll begin. On one economic philosopher, E.F. Schumacher, once wrote, there are two kinds of problems in the world. Those that if we as human beings work hard on can be solved, and those that cannot be solved but only dealt with. Problems of arithmetic are the easiest instances of convergent problems, problems that converge to a solution. But many complex engineering problems, such as the optimal design for a car or a bicycle or a house under given constraints, are convergent. They converge to an optimal rule or optimal solution. Problems that folks deal with in hard sciences are typically convergent. The other type of problems are divergent. You cannot find one solution. For instance, whether to be merciful or just is a divergent problem. You can try to find a practical balance, but the more you lean in one direction, the more you will have to compromise in the other. The problem of freedom and equality is another divergent problem. If you leave people to interact freely, you may be stuck with inequality. And if you force equality, you violate freedom. All the great human problems are divergent. The same can be said in Islam of juggling piety and politics. The more one involved with this worldly affairs, the less room one has for other worldly piety. And the Umayyads were the first instance of this extreme. The more one emphasizes other worldly piety, the less tolerance one has for political compromises and games. A good balance is an art, a product of wisdom rather than an exact science. I want to talk about one divergent problem that is at the heart of the kind of claims Islam makes. The problem emerges not out of any Islamic teachings per se, but is inherent to any claim of truth. The problem is the paradox between commitment to a truth on the one hand and coexistence, which requires tolerance for what one believes to be falsehood on the other. This divergent paradox is fully visible in the most empirical and non-dogmatic of human endeavors, empirical science. The neo-Darwinist, neo-mainstream, for example, finds it necessary to exclude intelligent design scientists from the realm of respectable science. For instance, even, through, uh, even though their truth, the evolutionary theory, is not supposed to be a matter of faith and belief. The more a matter is important, the higher the stakes, the greater the need for the truth to eliminate falsehood. Take, for instance, the scientific predictions about anthropogenic, man-made global warming. 
The majority of world scientists between 97 to 100% agree that global warming is man-made and a serious threat to current human civilization. There are some climate skeptics as well who in this case cannot be dismissed as a crazy minority because the issue at, at, at stake is the current human civilization and lives of millions. Coexistence with skeptics is not a luxury environmental leaders and human beings at large can entertain. Their skepticism destroys the possibility of the, ser of the serious and radical measures governments and individuals need to take in order to reverse or mitigate uh, the cataclysmic effects of global warming. Now consider the kind of truth Islam puts forth. There is one creator God, omnipotent and omniscient, in whom we are to believe and trust. This is the truth from your Lord. Never doubt it. This life, this, this word from the Quran, this life being a test, there is an eternal life of felicity or despair in store depending on how we respond to this truth. The stakes are much higher than global warming. In fact, they are incomparably higher. They are infinite. And perhaps precisely because it is so unintuitive that there be no compulsion in religion to save humans, the commandment sanctifying human life in the Quran is exaggerated as if to balance the infinity of stakes in this freedom to believe with the sanctity of life. Hence the verse, whoever has killed a soul except for a soul of corruption has killed all humans, and whoever has saved a soul has saved all humans. This exaggeration of the sanctity of even one single human soul in the Quran, I think, is, a necessary, is necessary to offset the stakes of believing in religious truth and its eschatological consequences. Imagine, for instance, a building on fire. You have seen the fire, but people on upper floors refuse to stop their diversion and play. Suppose these are school children. What do you do? You know there is a fire and all, exists, all uh, exits will soon be blocked. Do you coerce them? to exit the building. Why should their free will matter if they are employing it to ruin their eternity? St. Augustine, in one sermon, responded to the idea preached by his Donatist opponents that the unwilling are not forcibly brought to the truth by saying, uh, let constraint. So, so the Donatist belief that the unwilling should not be coerced. And St. Augustine's response was, let constraint be found outside. The will is born within meaning there should be coercion because um, once human beings are coerced and disciplined, they find the will to deal with it and then believe it. In fact, psychologically, anthropologically, he was correct. He further explained his recommendation with compelling reason. Quote, it is not true that nothing is accomplished by external pressure, for not only is the wall of hardened habit breached by human terrors, but the mind's faith and understanding is at the same time strengthened by divine authority and reason." Unquote. Put differently, it is only custom, habit, and other pathological reasons that keep men from accepting truth, the truth. And coercion and constraint can remove those, whereas excessive freedom turns even believers into disbelievers when spurred, by, uh, spurred on by vagaries of desire and the devil. Furthermore, the human response to properly applied constraint and force is not eternal resistance, but internal adjustment. People often believe what they are told to. As anthropologists and, psychologi and, and psychologists have frequently shown, the relationship between human environment and inner beliefs is far deeper and more complex than suggested by the Enlightenment understanding bequeathed to it by the Protestant Reformation that the faith only remains within. There is Further suggestion in history that people submit to force rather than eternally resisting. If not them, their succeeding generations come to, come to accept the truth. Let us return to the Quranic commandment, therefore, that says, There is no compulsion in religion in the face of both the high stakes and the empirical fact, both of which would favor coercion. What more, the Quran does not make this statement to encourage us to entertain any doubts about the truth, to propose the plurality of truth. But rather, precisely because, as the next clause in that verse says, there is no compulsion in religion, the truth has become manifest from error. Thus, whoever rejects the ta'ud, the rebellious, those rebellious against God, and believes in God, has his hold on a firm rope. Elsewhere, the Quran repeatedly says, the truth is from your Lord, so do not be among those who doubt. Besides this no compulsion verse, the Quran also tells the Prophet uh, salam, not to think. Uh, that he can compel or coerce, no matter how much he wants people to believe him. There were clear constructions, for example, in Surah 
Tauba, uh, that the polytheist must convert or leave Arabia. One verse says that if a polytheist is captured and, asked for, and asks for protection to hear the word of God, convey the word of God to him and then bring him to his place of safety and leave him. Later in this surah, Muslims are told to fight the people of the book who refuse to follow the Prophet's teachings until they are subdued except in Jizya, verse 929. Late, um, later, based on a prophetic tradition, this Jizya option is applied by the early leaders and jurists to all non-Muslims, not only Christians and Jews. They were, however, not coerced to believe in Islam. The wording of the Quran, one might note, is not very clear. No compulsion could just mean, as some later Muslim exegetes would say, like the Mu'tazila, the rationalists would say, um, that, that no one believes ex unless they want to. So this verse is not a commandment, but simply a description of facts. It should not, in other words, have any legal force. Uh, yet, these were later theorizations, a manifestation of idol exegesis, if you will, because the early practice, as well as later jurisprudence, established the principle of no compulsion and coexistence with non-Muslims as, as a matter of undeniable fact, a cornerstone of Islamic society and history. Uh, to, to, to contemplate this, think about, you know, we can speculate about the pros and cons of democracy and freedom and nation state. Uh, as long as a legal order is stably in place, and one's critique of democracy or the nation state is not likely to cause immediate breakdown of state authority, right? If that were the case, we academics would not be so calmly talking about it. So medieval exegetes in the same way are sort of speculating on all kinds of interpretations that are simply not the matter of what they take for granted. Umar the second caliph, for instance, is said to have once received an old Christian woman who complained of her poverty. Umar offered her help and then said in passing, a woman, this is the religion of truth, become Muslim. She said that she was old and had no need for it. Omar is then reported to have turned immediately to repentance, fearing he might have used coercion by this suggestion. And he prayed, Allahumma inni arshattu walam ukrih. I only hope, hope to guide, I did not coerce her. The third caliph, Uthman's wife, at the occasion of his assassination in Medina, was Naila, a Christian woman, Ali, the cousin of the Prophet, and the fourth caliph, wrote to his governor, cultivate compassion and love for your subjects and gentleness toward them. For there are two, they are of two kinds, either your brother in faith or your like in creation. The examples are too many, but I'll bring up a couple from the law, fiqh, to emphasize the point that the Quranic commandment of uh, la ikra was indeed a pillar of Islamic life and thinking and not a theoretical commandment about which people merely disagreed. Uh, once at Patricia Corona, uh, distinguished Orientalist at when I was at the University of Chicago uh, gave a lecture about uh, you know you know people say la ikraha no compulsion in religion there are so many exegesis about that that you know it shouldn't really mean anything what was quite innocently entire but innocently misleading about it is that she's talking about exegesis as if it was real life but in fact she should have looked at law to understand what that verse actually did Imam Shafi'i for example applies this verse in regulating relationship between a Muslim man and his kitabi wife, that is, his wife from the people of the book to a Christian, saying that it is not permissible for a man to preach Islam to his wife because it might count as coercion. Others, such as the Hanafis, disagreed that this would count as coercion without dispute, disputing that if it did, uh, it would be impermissible. Um, to add a, a letter by Awza'i to the Umayyads, uh, Imam al-Mawza'i, one of the great uh, early founders, uh, who wanted to relocate Christians due to some threat of war. Um, he wrote famously, they are not your slaves, they're free men, so long as they give you their tax, you have no right over their property or their life. Note that neither Shafi'i nor Awza'i are ecumenical pluralists. They are supersessionists, as is the classical opinion at large. The juristic protection of non-Muslims is strictly a matter of law, regardless uh, of how they felt about it. Their feelings, of course, went up and down in history over time, depending if there were crusades going on or the Mongols or something else. One of the most comprehensive works on the relationship with non-Muslims is Ibn Qayyim, uh, Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziya's Ahkam al-Ahkam al dhimma Scholars also know that even well before Ibn uh, Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim's time uh, in the 14th century, the crusades in particular and the rivalry between the re-energized Byzantine Empire and uh, in general uh, and crusades in particular, had, had elicited harsher doctrines of jihad among jurists at large. So this is the context of this book by Abdul Qayyim, which is unusually harsh um, 
uh, for, for because of this context. But nonetheless, Ibn al-Qayyim asks this question, why has God commanded to give protection to the people of the book and, and to non-Muslims at large? Why should we protect non-Muslims? Note that the, uh, and give them all of these rights. Note the, note the fact that the protection of non-Muslims and their compassionate treatment is never questioned by Ibn al-Qayyim, even though angry as he is at the Crusaders and so on. It is a matter of consensus and fact. After discussing the many explanations offered for this protection, that is the theological reasons, Ibn al-Qayyim presents his own answer, that the people of the book are protected in order to strengthen the proof of, proof of and belief in God and afterlife as they support the Islamic answers on these issues. This may not be entirely satisfactory, for a few pages later he shows that the agreement of scholars that a variety of other religions, including polytheists, in fact, all groups except the pagans of the Arabian Peninsula, were to be offered the choice of protection. The point simply is that the notion of la ikrah is both an unquestionable reality in Islamic history, thought, and law, yet at the same time, logically or philosophically, a, curio a curiosity. Um, it cannot be explained, I argue, by any interest-based or sociopolitical explanations. A historian would say that Muslim conquerors would have benefited from coercion on a number of occasions. The entire eastern half of Europe would have been Muslim today had the Ottomans not upheld this doctrine for centuries. So I will conclude my reflections with that same uh, paradox with which I began between truth and coexistence. Truth comes out of theology and the very basic logic of asserting an absolute truth of God. But it is Islamic law, it is the teachings of the Quran, the substance that almost unintuitively qualifies how that truth should be applied, not cause coercion, not save those children who choose to build to, to remain in a, in a building on fire, but rather la ikraha fiddin, there is no compulsion in religion. Thank you very much.